my dudes, my name is Tiffany. Welcome back to my series, Internet Analysis, where I like to research and discuss topics related to social issues and media. Today, my question is, why does YouTube seem to favor content from celebrities and corporations? Now, this is gonna be a very interesting one, okay? You gotta watch the whole thing. So, in this video, we're going to explore what YouTube is supposed to be from the perspective of viewers and creators, what direction YouTube seems to be going in, and why we're seeing so many more celebrities creating YouTube videos. Hi, I don't usually do this, but there is serious tea regarding celebrities on YouTube, so I very much recommend that you at least watch until this point. But you have to watch the whole rest of the video because it's a build-up, you know? YouTube is about authenticity. It is the place where any average person can film videos in their bedroom and blow up in popularity in a few months, if you're lucky. Corporate content, on the other hand, is not necessarily bad, but I think corporate has a negative connotation. I just imagine a group of mostly old white men in suits in a board meeting, discussing a focus group of what content appeals to kids these days. But really, that is not entirely fair because yes, some of the greatest content ever is technically produced by corporate entities, but corporate doesn't feel like YouTube. So let's talk about YouTube. Broadcast yourself. That's the slogan, or at least it used to be. YouTube was created as a video sharing website. Nowhere else online could a person upload a video to share with the public or friends and family. Soon enough, a few early YouTubers were born. That is, people who began to post regularly on the platform. Rather than just being users, they were creators. We had Smosh, Fred, Ryan Higa, in the early days, no one could have predicted the trajectory of YouTube or its creators. It was simply full of amateur, low or no budget content made by individuals or friends. Then the YouTube Partner Program was launched in December 2007 and the top YouTube creators began earning ad revenue. So looking at this chart of the top YouTubers from early 2008, we have Smosh at the top with about 250,000 subscribers and then most of the other channels in the top 10 are around 100,000 subscribers. Naturally, as money starts rolling in, YouTubers begin to treat this as a legitimate job. And very often they will incorporate, that is, they will register as a business, maybe an LLC or another corporation, mostly for tax purposes. And also a lot of YouTubers will start to upgrade, you know, get better equipment, but also add people to their team, be it videographers, writers, producers, editors, to help them improve their quality and manage their workload. And honestly, it's amazing to see a YouTuber go from filming in their bedroom to being a business owner with multiple employees. It's like the ultimate YouTube success story. So in this video, I'm going to refer back to this specific idea a lot, and that is what is authentic YouTube and what is corporate YouTube? Most channels are not corporations molding YouTubers, but rather they are YouTubers evolving, growing, upgrading. And even if a YouTuber technically owns their corporation, I wouldn't consider their content to be corporate. It's higher quality, it may be higher budget, but it still retains that authentic YouTube feel. Let's talk about traditional media versus YouTube. So there's a lot of high quality content on YouTube that a lot of people think would be worthy of, you know, becoming a show on Netflix. And occasionally YouTubers do get the opportunity to create a proper TV show. And obviously the YouTube community celebrates this. It's very exciting when one of us, one of our creators gets given this chance. Unfortunately, most people, probably not a lot of us because we love YouTube, but most people still think that online media, especially YouTube, is lesser than traditional media. Even if it's all digital media, the platform matters. YouTube is an open platform, more or less. Almost anyone can post. But to be able to get a show on Netflix or another streaming service, you have to be chosen. There's prestige in that. There's a level of approval. You're deemed worthy to create this more formal, traditional media, which gives you a lot more respect and legitimacy in the industry. And yet, when YouTubers are given opportunities outside of the platform, 
Sometimes it doesn't go well. Let's take Grace Helbig and her show on E! for example. I love Grace, I've been watching her for years, but I didn't watch this show, and I don't think that a lot of people did because it was kind of quickly canceled. So why aren't these YouTube turned TV shows successful? Well, first a creator would need to successfully bring their audience over to watch the show, which can be tough to do. But more so I think the problem is that something is different. The content feels overproduced and the voice of your creator may not sound like their voice anymore because maybe they have a whole team of writers behind them. The set is elaborate and unfamiliar. It's not the recognizable rooms that you're used to seeing. And sometimes the content itself feels restrained. Like you can almost tell that the person is kind of holding themselves back or acting different or speaking differently than they usually would on YouTube. So rather than this content flowing directly from the beautiful brain of your favorite content creator straight to you, it had to go through a writing and editing and approval process, so it just feels corporate. Now that's a more extreme example, but even when a YouTuber just gets an editor, viewers can usually tell. I mean, obviously a different person will edit differently, even if they are trying to mimic that creator's style. But sometimes even those small differences in editing can be very off-putting. Or maybe just the thought of someone else, Ken Burnsing, or adding sound effects to your favorite creator's videos just feels wrong. It's just not the YouTube we know and love, you know? You want your favorite creators themselves to suffer looking at their own face for hours on end. Recently, Cody Ko made a That's Cringe video with Noelle, and the editor went way too hard. And everyone freaked. <laughs> Plus, someone was just drying them out. <laughs> nice shot! And I'll be honest, the edits were a bit too much. Like, tone it down, please. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, these are dirty. Mom. No, no. Cody and Noelle are funny enough on their own. But the main point is that YouTube is very intimate. We get to know a creator and their voice and their style and their editing, so when things change, it's usually not welcomed with open arms. There's also a bit of the relatability element, so like we do relate to seeing someone in their room or their apartment, and we just don't relate as much to a full set or a whole production. Of course, it can still be entertaining, but it doesn't feel like YouTube. Next, I want to transition to the topic of Spill. There has been a lot of discussion about this recently. So Spill is a drama channel that produces really high quality, well-researched, animated videos. This whole scandals a lot, so I definitely recommend watching videos from D'Angelo Wallace or Petty Page if you want to get all the information, but here is a quick summary. Basically, viewers were impressed with Spill's content and their incredibly consistent upload schedule, and they were wondering, how is it possible to make such good videos so frequently? The viewers also had the impression that Spill was just the anonymous account of some girl who really likes animation and YouTube drama. So Spill had told its viewers that it was just a passion project created by a few friends. Who is Spill? Spill started out as a two-person passion project. We both love YouTube news and drama. Who doesn't? But it turns out, Spill was created by a media company called AWED Corp that had been around for years before Spill was created. So rather than being what the audience thought Spill was, it turned out to be a character created by a company and run by a whole team of people. And then the company began expanding to other genres with other new characters. To some, this isn't a big deal. If you like this channel and its videos, why should any of this matter? But to others, it does matter. First, because of the dishonesty. Some viewers felt betrayed because Spill lied, mostly by omission, about its origin and its structure. They only addressed the situation once people started digging. But also, this is worrying some YouTubers who see it as kind of a glimpse into a dystopian near future of the platform. D'Angelo put it really well. Why are companies pretending to be people? Two words, manufactured authenticity. Basically, people like people more than they like companies. So companies have started trying to act like people. Think about how fast food brands interact with Twitter. I think the Spill scandal also highlights how, as a community, we've become so suspicious of certain types of content, such as the apparent industry plant van girl. By the way, a couple of you asked me to cover that. I feel like so many people have made videos on it and they've done it justice, so I don't have much to say. But anyway, we want to know, is this YouTuber a person, or were they molded to be the perfect YouTuber by a team of people? We want to be able to tell very clearly if something is organic and real, 
or if it's been orchestrated, produced, or master planned. I don't really care to get into the nitty gritty of the whole spill situation, but if we're thinking about content as a binary, either independent or corporate, I would definitely consider spill to fall under corporate content. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. I mean, they clearly make good videos and it does fit in well on YouTube. I basically see Spill on a similar level as BuzzFeed and those other media giants that create an impossible amount of content every day across every possible genre. I mean, it is corporate content. People are literally working nine to five creating this, but it can still be good content and I do think it does have a place on YouTube. However, another big part of this issue is competition. This team of people can create much higher quality content much more frequently than an individual content creator could. So other drama channels, for example, can't really compete with Spill. And I think that is one of the major problems that YouTubers have with corporate content. YouTube was supposed to be a platform for independent creators. And obviously there's enough competition amongst all of us. So it sucks to also have to compete with these media giants. Now, obviously this is all fair game because any person or even any company has all the same rights to upload videos on YouTube, but creators can feel threatened because we kind of already feel like we're always fighting against issues like demonetization and we're trying to please the algorithm somehow and remain relevant. And probably most importantly, it really feels like independent content creators are being prioritized less and less on YouTube. That being said though, I still think there's a huge distinction between companies like Buzzfeed or Spill who are creating content for YouTube versus mainstream content that gets posted to YouTube as just part of their distribution. Jimmy Fallon, Jimmy Kimmel, late night show clips are all over YouTube. And I'll admit, I never really seek them out, but they're always in my recommended and I will watch them occasionally. My favorites are Last Week Tonight with John Oliver. They're really good. But clearly, YouTube promotes the shit out of these very traditional, very mainstream shows. Suddenly, valuable space on the homepage and trending tab that could have gone to YouTubers was now going to TV shows with built-in audiences and millions of dollars. Then there were the last three YouTube Rewinds hosted by The Rock, Stephen Colbert, and Will Smith. The fact that YouTube was pushing these Hollywood actors and TV stars as the face of their site came off a little tone deaf. Why does YouTube promote this mainstream TV content so much? Mm, because it makes money. These shows bring in billions of views. It does feel strange though. Why is YouTube recommending this so often? How do late night shows end up on the front page of YouTube or constantly trending? There are so many independent content creators struggling to get eyes on their content trying so hard to be blessed by the algorithm, and yet YouTube just keeps promoting mainstream TV shows. Speaking of, here's a clip from the David Pakman show. He is a political commentator, and in this clip he's talking about the recommendation and views of mainstream media outlets like CNN, Fox, versus independent YouTube commentators and the views and recommendations that they get. On May 1st, those numbers crashed, and they went from between one and 3% to between 0.03% and half a percent. So YouTube obviously changed something in their algorithm because suddenly these independent political channels are all getting a way smaller slice of the news views. Meanwhile, recommendations and views for mainstream news are going up. Previously, I estimated that we had lost about 2 million views per month from this algorithm, recommending our videos more and more infrequently. Not to mention news and politics channels already struggle with so much demonetization because a lot of the topics that they cover are considered controversial. Though I do wonder when CNN covers those same topics, are they getting demonetized? Hmm. Anyway, for independent small channels, a loss of millions of views per month is devastating and that can prevent a channel from being able to continue making videos. But ultimately, if YouTube is going to do this, I don't know what we can do. It's completely within their right to do this. I just think it is a perversion of their original existence, which was independent content. Now, just the same old legacy corporate content that people get through cable subscriptions. This is a decision that is anti-independent 
pro-corporate. So why does YouTube favor mainstream media news over independent media? It could again be the legitimacy factor. Obviously mainstream networks are considered to be the most legitimate news sources we have. Though of course each network has their own slant and bias and they have owners that they may not want to piss off so maybe it's in their best interest to maintain the status quo but that is for another video. Mostly I think a lot of it is because mainstream media is considered to already be ad friendly. They've basically been pre-approved because obviously they run commercials on their actual TV shows. I'm sure that these networks already have relationships with the advertisers. Independent YouTube political commentators, though, are probably not considered by most to be legitimate, though I personally find them compelling, and I like that they are open about their bias, and they discuss topics that typically aren't covered by mainstream networks, even though mainstream networks have nearly unlimited resources and 24-hour news cycles, you'd think they'd have the time. <sighs> So what would be YouTube's justification for this? I don't know, YouTube could say maybe they're trying to cut down on fake news content, which would imply that the independent creators are sharing the fake news and that mainstream news could never perpetuate fake news or misleading things or wildly incorrect things. But I don't think YouTube has addressed this situation at all. They don't usually address anything, to be honest. The thing is though, the same thing could be argued for all mainstream versus independent content on YouTube. Bottom line, YouTubers want to keep their advertisers happy, which means keeping content ad friendly. Mainstream content is generally seen as safe and because of a few bad apples, advertisers may see independent media as more risky, unless those creators happen to be very family friendly. Anyway, this is just another example of YouTube promoting mainstream content over independent content. At a YouTube presentation put on for advertisers, top creators were nowhere to be found. Instead, there was the YouTube the company wants advertisers to see. Ariana Grande on Vivo, series from Kevin Hart and Demi Lovato, clips from The Tonight Show featuring Jimmy Fallon. YouTubers are also facing competition from another mainstream media facet. Finally, we get to talk about celebrities creating YouTube content. I don't know if you've noticed, but there are tons of celebrity channels popping up every day. And even though I watch like zero traditional celebrity content, it is all over my recommended. It's funny because YouTubers aren't generally well respected in the industry, but suddenly we're seeing celebrities who want to be YouTubers. Of course, in addition to the acting and other work that they still do. You're on my vlog. How are you? Hi, vlog. Vlog. It's vlog. vlog. My question is, why? I mean, that's the big question of this video. Here are my theories. For celebrities, YouTube is just another arm of social media and influence. I think it's wise to get as many followers on as many different platforms as possible. Also, they've surely noticed that online creators, especially YouTubers, have much stronger connections with their followers and therefore more influence than most celebrities do with their fans. So yeah, you may follow a celebrity you like on Instagram because you think they're attractive and you like their show, but you feel like you know your favorite YouTuber. You have spent hours listening to and watching them. Celebrities want in on that connection. It is valuable. You're probably much more likely to buy something that is sponsored by one of your favorite YouTubers rather than a random product that a celebrity promotes on Instagram. So of course celebrities may want in on this AdSense coin or brand deal money, but the main weird thing about celebrity YouTube channels is that they just don't feel like authentic YouTube channels. They want to be, but they're usually like too high quality too scripted. So I'm gonna bring you straight into my home and show you how to do red carpet makeup on a drugstore budget. This concealer is $9. To me, it's priceless. Until they get super famous, most YouTubers have no budget, they don't have expensive equipment, they make their videos entirely by themselves. But the vast majority of celebrities on YouTube have full production teams from the start. And to be honest, most of them are making super generic content. It's like popular person plus popular topic equals popular YouTube video. If you're trying to follow a formula, it just won't feel real. The essence of YouTube is getting to know a person because they put so much of themselves into every video. So again, like when YouTubers have proper TV shows, 
Celebrity YouTube channels can have a lot of the same downsides. It feels overproduced. It doesn't feel natural. Authentic YouTube is usually more gritty. It can be slightly lower quality, but that's kind of what we love. Like we like seeing people do their little like me editing cut-ins. Hey. But on that note, I want to give credit to one person in particular, and that is Jack Black, because I've heard a lot of people say that he's their favorite celebrity YouTuber, and I think that he's doing it right, because he's not trying to act like a YouTuber, he's just being a YouTuber. You got Viking beard Jack Black in a freaking PewDiePie chair talking about ninja and doing the but can you do this meme while Megalovania plays. What is this? Is this a freaking fever dream? Compared to most of the other mainstream celebrities coming over to YouTube, this was a total breath of fresh air. There was no big production team, just Jack Black and someone holding an iPhone. What a legend. Anyway, to be honest, celebrities on YouTube didn't really interest me either way until I found out this piping hot tea. And yes, this is so spicy that I literally had to use the term tea to describe it. I don't know why something that would be spicy would be tea because tea's not spicy. White people, am I right? No, unless we're talking about chai. Chai's kind of spicy. Spicy tea. All right. Why are celebrities making YouTube channels and why is YouTube promoting celebrity content so heavily? Oh, because YouTube has been paying celebrities to make content. Excuse me? I didn't know this. This is all the way back from 2011. Google ready to spend $100 million to get celebrities building YouTube channels. To get the celebs on board, Google is offering up to $5 million per channel. The money would cover salaries and production costs. Google would make the money back through premium advertising. So again, they are investing in these celebrities. They're paying them a lump sum. That's their salary and their production budget. But really quickly, I just wanna be very clear right now that not all celebrities on YouTube have been paid by Google. I don't think there's any public information about who exactly has been paid because that would kind of foil this whole plan. So to be clear, any clips of celebrity YouTubers that I put in this video, I am not trying to imply that they have been paid to be on YouTube, other than AdSense, obviously, okay? But yes, that article was from 2011. YouTube has been trying to get celebrities on this platform for a long time. To be real, a lot of people start YouTube channels with the hopes that maybe someday they'll get big enough to earn some money from it, you know, ad revenue. So okay, I don't fault celebrities for wanting to maybe join in on this, but holy shit. I never considered that someone would be paid just to start their channel. So naive of me. So now when I see these highly produced celebrity YouTube channels, I'm like, huh, did you really have a passion for YouTube and you just wanted to connect with your fans? Or did Google pay you and pay for your production? Just wondering. Just seems a lot less genuine. This definitely does not feel like authentic YouTube. I'm gonna ask again, why? YouTube is clearly courting celebrities. YouTube, home of the nobodies who become internet somebodies. For some reason, YouTube also wants to be home of celebrities who get to be like real and connect with people, I guess. It is not clear to me why YouTube would want to get mainstream celebrities on the platform other than the obvious. If they get views, YouTube makes money. It would be one thing to, you know, recommend these videos, promote these videos, but it's a whole other thing to literally actively recruit them and pay them to make channels. I just can't get over it. The present and future of YouTube, more and more celebrities. I wanna introduce you guys to a guy named Derek. Derek Blasberg, I think is how you pronounce it. He is the head of the fashion section of YouTube. He's tasked with cultivating relationships with brands and high profile people in the industry so that they will use the platform more often, more effectively, and build audiences there. I first noticed this guy because he was commenting on Emma Chamberlain's Instagram pictures and I was like, who is this? And then it all clicked. He must be the guy who's responsible in some way for Emma Chamberlain's whole collaboration with Louis Vuitton and all of the fashion shows that she's been going to. So yes, for everyone who was like, wow, good for Emma, but how did she end up working with a company like Louis Vuitton? Probably Derek. 
Speaking of money, YouTube and Blasberg, for the record, would not comment on whether it compensated individuals, brands, or creators for their efforts or simply picked up the tab for content production. There was actually a big party where like huge celebrities and YouTube stars mingled to celebrate the launch of YouTube's new fashion vertical. YouTube tries to get fashionable. YouTube executives began to realize that some of its fashion and beauty creators were starting to attract large audiences. This would lead to a number of opportunities including commercial partnerships with luxury brands. We thought, if it's already happening organically, imagine what could happen if we really started to work on this. I know this video is getting long, but stay with me. The last thing I want to talk about is something that makes it super clear that YouTube is prioritizing celebrities, and that is its recent failed new verification badge check mark situation. Prior to this, any channel that passed 100,000 subscribers and was verified to not be a spam account would be given this verified check mark. In addition to the 100,000 subscriber plaque, which is like a nice perk of hitting an exciting milestone. And it is meaningful, especially to mid-tier channels for a number of reasons. By the way, I don't know what's considered small, medium, or large in terms of YouTube subscribers anymore, so whatever. But that check mark makes you feel legit. And for a lot of us on YouTube, this is the only place where we can get a check mark because I'm not gonna be verified on Twitter and I'm not gonna be verified on Instagram. But anyway, practically, it's also helpful because it can help other viewers find your channel if they happen to see your comment in a comment section. It can help YouTubers find other YouTubers in their comments so people make friends. I've made some YouTube friends this way. So YouTube came out suddenly and it was like, oh, by the way, we're changing our verification rules and we're gonna take check marks away from people who no longer fit these new requirements. Sorry. They wanted to get rid of the check mark because they said it's confusing. It's not. And they wanted to replace it with this disgusting gray highlighter. Why? Who approved this? So among all of the new requirements, here are a few. Basically the risk of being impersonated. You must submit news sources that reference you. And you must be widely recognized outside of YouTube. Why should a YouTuber need to be well-known outside of the platform where they are most well-known in order to be verified on their main platform? Riddle me this. Many YouTubers are huge, but not mentioned often in mainstream news because they are unproblematic faves and they don't have any controversy or scandals in order to be in the mainstream media because we know that the mainstream media is not out there posting anything positive about YouTubers. But anyway, these new eligibility requirements clearly favored celebrity YouTube channels. Risk of being impersonated? Yep. Featured in mainstream news? Yep. Widely known outside of YouTube? Yep. They should have included not well known on YouTube because that's true for most celebrity YouTubers too. Am I salty? Yes. YouTube is officially taking the U out of YouTube and changing it to CelebTube, CorpTube. So yeah, people were pissed about this pissed. It was popping off on Twitter and luckily YouTube caved to the criticism and decided to walk back the whole thing and say that everybody who has a check mark will keep it and they may mess with the eligibility stuff in the future. But anyway, they're not going to be taking anybody's check mark away, which is great. But what the hell were you thinking in the first place? Creators often get really mad with YouTube because it seems like they tend to make changes for inexplicable reasons that not only don't benefit creators, but usually harm creators. Like this is YouTube, damn it. Like we the creators are YouTube, right? No. YouTube creators are like one part of YouTube, but they're definitely not the main priority by far. So those new failed eligibility requirements definitely signaled the direction that YouTube was slash is heading in. It was a strong signal that they want more celebrity content and celebrity content will be protected, rewarded, lifted up. It would be distinct from other peasant content from ugh, YouTubers. The thing is, YouTube is repositioning itself, and honestly, it has been for years. In a media landscape, which is currently dominated by like online streaming services, honestly, everybody's trying to get in on it. YouTube has original content, YouTube Red. YouTube is, I think, one of the biggest online platforms for music and music videos. They have YouTube Music. And YouTube is diversifying, but strangely, None of that includes putting any additional effort or help into actual YouTubers. Strange choice. 
YouTube is always telling us that like we created YouTube and that YouTube would be nothing without us. And it's like, they don't care about us, but they know that we have no alternative. So we have to stay and they can do whatever they want. So clearly all of this is very disheartening and, and disappointing to YouTubers that aren't late night hosts or mainstream celebrities. Again, this is the only platform we have and we are constantly facing issues like algorithm changes and demonetization and yada, yada, yada. YouTube is allowed to diversify, you know? It's cool that you wanna invite celebrities to the platform, but we're just asking like, can you just throw us a freaking bone here? I cannot say that without thinking of Austin Powers. Anyway, wow, long video. I really hope you guys enjoyed it. Hope you learned something new. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe for more internet analysis videos. You guys can follow me on Instagram for some mediocre pics. You can follow me on Twitter for some political tweets. I'm always popping off there. And again, stay tuned for more content. You never know what I'm gonna cover next. I never know what I'm gonna cover next. And YouTube, please keep blessing me. You've been really nice to me with the algorithm lately and it would suck if you suddenly decided to hate me because I exposed you just a little bit. Okay, okay, thanks, bye.